This interview is being conducted for St John Scotland, 75 years of making a difference. My name is Dr Sue Morrison and the respondent is Anne Mitchell. This is the 21st of April 2022 and the interview is taking place in South Queensbury. Thank you very much for agreeing to be interviewed for the project Anne. You're welcome. Um, for the record, would you please confirm your name? Sure, it's Anne Mitchell. And could you give me your year of birth? Painful question. 1957. Thank you. Uh, and where were you brought up, Anne? Um, I was born in Fife, uh, but I've spent most of my life in uh, Edinburgh area. Um, Mum and Dad grew up, brought us all up in Blackhall. May I ask you some questions about your family? Certainly. Yeah. Um, Blackhall's a, is a lovely place. Um, could you tell me a bit about your family there? Um, we moved there in 1964. Mum and Dad bought the house next to my mum's aunt. Um, I don't know that it would have been an area that we would they would necessarily have normally afforded, but because the family knew who they were, they managed to get their, their deal. And I always remember my dad telling me about the, the mortgage. He thought it was going to go down. It was 3% at that point. And so he went on a variable rate and at one point he ended up on 14%. <laughs> but this was his their dream. We lived across the road from the park. It was safe. As children, there's three of us. I, I'm the eldest. We used to play in the park, just cross the road. Mum would shut the curtains in her bedroom when it was time to come home for tea. So it was a good, happy background um, and a nice area to live. We were very lucky. Thank you. Could you tell me a bit about your career, please? I've been a nurse. I still am a nurse. Um, I've always wanted to be a nurse. Um, I played with my dollies when they were wee and I decided about age eight that I wanted to be a nurse. I was going to be a children's nurse, but my dad thought that was more like being a nursery nurse. So he thought that I could do more. So I started nursing at 17 and a half in the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh. And I remember my dad taking me on the first day to the nurse's home and he wasn't allowed in with my suit suitcase because it was no men. Um, and that was the start of my career and I did end up with my babies. I became, I used nursing as a a means of travel. I've travelled all around the world as a nurse and um, I became a neonatal intensive care nurse when I was working in Australia. So I got my babies and I stayed in neonates from then on till the end of my career and I ended up as a nurse consultant, um, the only Scottish neonatal nurse consultant at the time. Um, and I was in the neonatal transport service and we moved babies from a smaller hospital where they maybe needed slightly more care and moved them into a, a bigger centre. And because I was a, a nurse practitioner again, I was the first neonatal nurse practitioner in Scotland. So I could work instead of a doctor. Um, and I loved that job. I had my cake and I ate it. Really did. Loved it. And you recently retired? Yes, I well, I've retired twice now. Um, I re when I first retired was when I first approached St John's to become a, maybe a CPR instructor, see if there was something I could still use with my career. But um, during COVID, I uh, went back to work and was a vaccinator um, in one of the mass sites. And I've just recently re-retired from that. <laughs> so we'll see what happens now. Congratulations. And that's an impressive career. I was just lucky I got the right career for me. When I listen to nursing now, it doesn't seem to be as much um, of a fulfilment for you, for the younger girls going in. There's an awful lot more set shifts and a lot of things that are negative about it, which is a shame because I absolutely loved it. And it was a way of me traveling all around the world. I worked in America, I worked in Australia, traveled all the bits in between, and then I worked in Saudi Arabia. So it was just, it was the right time for the right career. And I certainly found it was what I needed. You must have seen some stark variations in the types of healthcare delivered in these countries. Very much, very much. From America, where you were peeling stickers off items as you took them off the shelves and then putting it onto the patient's charge chart, to the UK, where what you needed, you got. Um, I think there's just 
huge variations in the Australian system where there's a bit of insurance and a bit of um, free going. What would you say is your best memory um, of, of your work? Of my work? Oh gosh. I think that, I mean, the best thing is, is a baby who has been critically ill and you're very much a part of that family at that point because nobody else is there. It's it's the mum and the dad and this baby's just been born. To see that baby transferred and progress, the family grow into a family and that baby go home or back to its base hospital. I think that was just a reward within its itself. And even even with sad outcomes, you knew that you had given that child a chance and supported the family through that situation. Could you tell me how you got involved with St John Scotland? When I first retired, I was looking for what I could do to fill in my time. I'd been a very active person. I was still working full time uh, and not so much nights, but did on call at nights. So I was used to doing being active and Save a Life Scotland was advertising uh, quite widely at that point. And I contacted them and was put in touch with St John and I've been with them ever since. And I've gone from being a CPR champion to a C the CPR lead for the um, St John in the De City defibrillator project in Edinburgh. Were you already trained in CPR? As a nurse, yes. Plus I already taught with um, NHS Scotland. I did a lot of neonatal resuscitation talks for all the different kinds of professionals um, that might come across a newborn baby needing recess. So I was fairly comfortable beforehand uh, with it. And again, working with the ambulance service was up to date with what was happening um, for normal policies and procedures. So this was four or five years ago? Yeah, be coming up to five years probably. Could you tell me what the um, what the uh, St John Scotland organise as an organisation was like in relation to CPR delivery? Um, at that point, it was fairly much um, the leads had self taught themselves very accurately, uh, very competently. They all knew what there was and had got all the guidelines sorted out and were very um, able to do it. Um, I think now we have more of a, uh, we have a CPR lead within headquarters, which is hopefully going to make more cohesive um, across Scotland for what we're doing. You're the CPR lead. Um, is that for just this area or the whole of Scotland? No, 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 no. I'm just CPR lead for um, the Edinburgh area, Edinburgh South East to a certain extent, but not um, more local. Covid aside, if you mm -hmm. can imagine <laughs> that far yeah. back, um, could you kind of walk me through an average day um, at work with St John Scotland? Um, a lot is a lot of it is done in the background. It's um, knowing who has like the um, the lead for Edinburgh will ha the chair will have um, found the group that want the um, defibrillator allocated to them. Uh, she will have made the presentation and I follow up at the back. OK, you have a defibrillator. Let's give you the chance to learn how to use it. And that's usually taken up pretty quickly with people. So a lot of my stuff is a, is the admin in the background because people will say, oh, yeah, I'd love that. Um, well, we're busy this week and next week. And so it's chasing backwards and forwards doing that. That can be quite time consuming. And then once you've got them pinned down, it's getting the, the volunteers involved. So we have a very strong volunteer uh, group and we have a cohort of about 20 who are, who are used to doing it and have done it a lot and are very determined to come back post-COVID and they're very skilled. And then I tend to be on most of the training uh, just because that's my personality. I think that's a responsibility I've been given and I feel that I should be there. Um, but equally, other people should be getting that chance to lead it. The actual sessions are relatively short. You have, um, you sort of assess, particularly with COVID now, you have to assess the area that they want you to be teaching in, but it varies hugely. We could be doing a primary school 
and starting primary seven working our way down and what you teach primary one is very different with a teddy bear and uh, do you know where you live to the the p7s who want to know how to do this and that they may not have the strength but they could show an adult what to do your language and your body language is very different for that group to an older group perhaps in sheltered housing again who for fragility reasons might not be able to actually do the process but they can understand it and they can tell that person that's passing who would like to help but doesn't know what to do how to do it so they're very different groups and then you'll have drop-in sessions um, we did Port Edgar Open Day with the Water Centre down in South Queensferry and we had 365 people pass through our hands all having a go on a mannequin but it was a beautiful sunny day so our problem there was not hypothermia it was sunburn so it's just try, trying to preempt what you're going to need on the days how many staff you're going to how many volunteers you're going they're not staff how many volunteers you're going to need uh, to carry out this training whether one person two people or six people are needed and therefore how many mannequins you need and spacing out particularly now post-covid is thinking about the safety of the volunteers as well as the people attending because if people are motivated to do something they very quickly forget that they're supposed to be separating you find them sitting all close together in a um, bowling club for instance you know you've spaced everything out but then they want to sit together with each other in their pint and they're quite crammed in and you're thinking this isn't really quite what we were doing um i think initially and i think a lot of the cpr people don't twig that we're part of st john um and it took me a while because we were edinburgh and i was friendly with liz um crawford who was in the head office and she'd had done cpr before me so we kind of all linked together i didn't know what was what i couldn't work out where edinburgh sat and where head office sat i actually thought for quite a long time that they were one and the same thing and i couldn't quite work out what their their differences were but i don't think there's really a, an easy way to bring that out in an interview side of things i know more about it now and I've, i am now a member of st john having been nominated but again i didn't quite twig that that was quite an honor but yes i mean i but i had volunteered to do cpr so that was all I wanted to do. I wasn't really interested in, in whether I did it through St John or Red Cross or Save a Life. I, it just, that was what, something I wanted to do. And therefore it facilitated my needs as well as me helping with that. And I got to know the staff very well. So it just seemed that the, the linking, I wasn't quite aware of, the fact that there were two separate entities but that's probably because we were in Edinburgh and we have a very strong team in Edinburgh and there's also the strong management team but they're they're open and friendly and not above so therefore it didn't strike me that there was a, a difference between them all but the actual knowledge of St John as an organisation has come over time which is maybe a shame I think if I had been doing it with um, Red Cross I would know I was part of Red Cross I knew I was part of St John, but I didn't really know what St John was because I knew that St John's ambulance service, which is in England, wasn't allowed to teach up here or there was a, a gentleman's agreement or whatever, that it was St Andrews who do the teaching and the provision of first aid services here. But I hadn't quite worked out that this was a, a, a much bigger thing that I'd entered into than I'd realised. And I'm quite happy for that and quite proud of it now that I know about it. What do you know about the history of St John now? That we've come from, oh gosh, I guess you go back to the Crusades and the hospitaliers and everything from there and that there is a long, rich history of giving. And looking after community which again I wasn't that sure about before and sadly I don't know that the general public has a big enough image of all of that um, 
the people who are involved are the people who do things quietly, but do them. And I think that's really important. I think that's that's very much my philosophy on life. You get on and you do things. If it needs done, get on with it. And that is an ethos that I find throughout St John, that people are doers. What do you think could be done to um, make St John Scotland better known in Scotland? I think there's an awful lot of work being done on that at the moment. Um, speaking to the people that are in the head office, um, there's a lot with rebranding and what we stand for and it's still too early to see whether that will have an impact on society and what they recognise. People certainly at rugby games and so on recognise the insignia but don't necessarily know that that's St John's Scotland and that it's different to St John's. Um, but hopefully all this work will have its own reward and that it will have a higher profile and bring in newer people. We're certainly bringing in plenty of people to do the jobs, you know, the, the teaching CPR. Um, I have a, certainly in this area a very healthy um, group. Um, still have to do some of the basic training with some of them. That's how many new people we've had in. So there is there is a difference. There's a change coming, and hopefully it'll be for for the benefit of the whole organisation. How have the volunteers been identified and recruited? Now I'm not directly involved with the the first point of contact. People tend to contact um, the headquarters, and then we're given the information about them. And 90% of people who put themselves forward for something at any point in life know what they want and uh, know what their skills are and can offer that. Occasionally, there are people where it's maybe not quite the right thing for them, um, that somebody who's excruciatingly shy might find this impossible to stand up and sell what they're talking about, be it CPR or anything else. It needs a bit of bounce and... and fun element but that can come as you grow and so long as the people who are working with you can support you through that then I don't think there's anybody that has to be turned down from volunteering altogether some people may not physically be able to do it because teaching CPR is quite physically demanding however there are other things that are needed done you know there, we need people to talk about what St John does we need people to do can collecting we need to be able to you know to find the money to then put out defibrillators there has to be a, a system through there we have one young person who is doing her duke of edinburgh award and going around and checking defibrillators for their um dates on pads dates on batteries and that the green light is flashing once a month those are all jobs that lots of us can do but maybe don't choose to so i think if somebody volunteers and it's not the appropriate thing for them, there's something else that they can do. But you do have to think about, we go into schools, we go into um, places where there's a lot of elderly. We do have to consider their safety as well as the people volunteering. And you have to be able to work together. Do volunteers for the CPR training... Um, go through the disclosure process? Yes, they all have PPG. Um, what kind of skills would you say that your existing cohort of volunteers have brought to the <clears throat> organisation? A variety, just as society has a variety of people. Um, we have somebody who is, well, we have the young girl I mentioned earlier who's doing her Duke of Edinburgh Award. She wants to come and help teach CPR as well, which is excellent, and I will always make sure she's with an appropriate buddy. Um, we have somebody who is a very, very powerful speaker who is a CPR survivor, and he will tell his story when you're doing your recess. And again, very that's a very powerful message but you also have to know who your audience is because if you have another CPR survivor in the audience, sometimes that is too much for them or they would love to have a chat because they have something in common that nobody else has or very few people have. Um, we have 
a new mum, brought her baby along to the last teaching we were doing. Uh, we have retired medical staff. We have people who have no medical or nursing knowledge. Um, we have nurses that aren't quite ready to retire properly. So there's a whole mix and I think it's just as society has, we've got a whole mix and while an outgoing personality might appeal to somebody, it might intimidate somebody else and you have to be aware of how your group responds in different ways and put them with the appropriate trainers. I think that's probably yes, we have some policemen that teach with us as well. How much time would you say that you spend on the CPR work? It varies. It varies on how many people have got back to me. I tend to have a flurry at um, the middle of the month before to try and chase people and say, right, can I pin you down to dates for next week? And then I'll make up a grid of when we're teaching. I'll get that out to all my CPR instructors, fill in the slots of where people come back and say, yes, I'm free. So there tends to be a bit of a flurry of a couple of days where it's fairly intense. And then after that, it's really just keeping on top of the emails and then the physical teaching. Very sad. I know exactly which square to stand on at the tram stop because the door will open next to the luggage rack. I step in and I turn my luggage in and it plonks into that space and that's me for my journey. So it um, saves money. Thank you. Um, do you know much about any of the other activities that St John Scotland are involved with? Um, depending on the areas, I think we've got mountain rescue, obviously near a mountain. Um, not so much the city centre. We do fundraising, um, which I I will put my hand up and say that just I isn't me. But I'm very passionate about my CPR. Lots of people are doing both. Um, then there is the presentations of the the defibrillators, giving people support through getting them into place in their in their community. The Sporting hospital over the hospital overseas. It's the Jerusalem Eye Hospital, um, and again, sometimes people come back to because they don't know the history of St John. Why are you why are you supporting something overseas when there's a lot of needs here? But there are a lot of organisations doing things here too, uh, and I think it is understanding the history and why that hospital is is supported. Um, I think. Going back far enough, there was um, various pots of money and being allocated from different areas to different things. I know we actually got a neonatal intensive care ambulance from St John, which was based in the west of Scotland. Um, but that must be about, that must be more than 10 years old now or about 10 years old. So they'll be <laughs> looking for another one. But there's, pulling the funding into more core directions so that the whole image is supporting the same things rather than bitty I think is probably a good thing but apart from that I'm not very very clear on any of the other things that's just the things that I've been involved with what would you say are your um, challenges um, challenges is getting volunteers that are free through the day because businesses want taught CPR through the day, Monday to Friday. And uh, unless I'm using retired people like myself, then there's not a lot of us available. Um, obviously, the chair is here on a Monday, Tuesday, so I can tap in and join with her. But um, that that's probably my biggest challenge as a CPR lead is, is getting people who are available through the day. Um, are there any challenges connected with um, accessing good venues or equipment or anything like that? Venues vary. Um, we very much try and teach where the defibrillator is. So getting people to allocate a, a venue themselves within their community. So we have a lot of church halls. Um, we've done one or two outside. Um, we were doing a fitness centre and it was still during COVID, but because they had had to use their equipment, they really were quite anxious. So we did that outside in the driveway. Um, so it's it, you do need to be flexible and finding 
places where you get somewhere and find that you've got to climb a flight of stairs with your four dolls in a bag is not always the best thing. Um, but you can get around everything. If you're motivated to do it, you can do it. Just um, and being honest with people where you where you are about your access needs. You know, is there disabled access that you could use to bring the mannequins in? Can you have windows open? Can we limit the numbers? I'll do it twice instead of once so that we can spread the numbers out and allow people to clean the mannequins in between. How many people can you teach at any one time? Oof. Well, it's, it's difficult to say because if you've got a drop-in session, you've just got constantly people coming through. Ideally, I would not want to see more than six people per mannequin. If you were doing a set, this is my talk, this is the information, this is where we're going. But in a perfect world, it would probably only be two people on a mannequin at a time, and especially with um, COVID spreading your distance and things like that. And I can get people to go away and do a quiz or something that we've thought about um, in the background and just come over in pairs that suit them. So if they're working together, then it seems sensible that they come and do the, the CPR together or if they're a family, come together. You mentioned COVID a few times now. Do you think that has changed the way that you will work in future? I think because COVID has altered society and society's views of what is acceptable and what is normal, then it's bound to impact on what we're doing. And I have a duty of care, not just to the people who are learning, but the people who are teaching. The We were always teaching CPR without any mouth. So it was cardiac compressions rather than cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And that had already impacted on the figures of survival, that we had improved the figures of survival before COVID came along quite dramatically. Save a Life Scotland figures, I think, were 1 in 20 survival in Scotland when they started. And I want to say that it was 1 in 12 by the time COVID came along. And that was already without doing any mouth to mouth. You were tipping the head back and moving the tongue, but you weren't touching anything and you weren't doing breaths for anybody. So already that had changed and we're not going to go back to that. Uh, we're, we're, we're not going to add it in now. Um, I think it's very interesting that when you set up a session, people tend to be, oh, yes, we need lots of space. We need this. We need that. And wearing masks or not. And then reality comes along. And particularly for the learners, they suddenly start mixing. And you're thinking, oh, don't do that. But actually, that's maybe just me as a nurse. I've been working in a vaccine centre wearing a mask 12 hours a day or at least changing it every four hours or whatever. But it was... I'm used to it and it doesn't give me a problem. But now that society is opening up more, it's interesting to watch and just see how people are. But we do have to take precautions because you don't want to suddenly see cause of an outbreak being a teaching session that you've done. What would you say that your volunteers get out of volunteering with um, St John's Scotland? Everybody comes with a different reason. Some people enjoy the social aspect of it, that they meet each other and they're doing things together. Everybody wants to be doing something for other people. They all want to impart a knowledge. They're all very passionate about CPR and the need. So some of that may come from knowing somebody or losing somebody. You know, if I'd known, I could have done. Um, or just, this is something I like doing. And there, there's quite a group, I would say, fall into that category. That, And I, I enjoy the social aspect of it. I like bouncing in front of people and being able to talk to people and talking to strangers and being able to feel I've given them a skill that might just make a difference. And I very much feel that the CPR lead role is empowerment be that to your learners or the volunteers that you're bringing with you. What would you say is your best memory of working with St John's Scotland? Hmm. 
the the individual learner who comes up to talk to you separately and there's something in the background of their lives that they feel able to share with you that's that's difficult and that you've managed to open a door for them What would you say are your hopes for the future of St John Scotland? I see it as being at a point of growth at the moment. Change, which might be difficult for some people who've been established within it for a long time, but most people that you meet who've been there a long time are very open if it's going to benefit St John's. So I'm hoping that it's at a, a point where it's going to go on a trajectory of growth and openness to the public so that it's not this unknown organisation or a sort of vague idea. I'd like to see people know that's St John and that's what they're doing. In relation to CPR, I know lots of companies that deliver CPR training. Mm -hmm. Do you think there are limits to what St John Scotland can do? Um, St John Scotland delivering CPR is delivering CPR to everybody, whether you can afford it or not. And um, I'm not quite sure... I think as a nurse, where I think this is a basic information that everybody should have access to and be given, um, parents with new babies, everything, I think it should be there. It should be part of our NHS almost. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about people charging £50 for a, a session that I can run and do for free. But equally, those people are entitled to have some money and, and to have an income and if they're teaching it properly... But there's not any, there's not a quality audit or um, overarching power supervising these things to say, yeah, this is this is legitimate teaching and it's accurate. Um, it probably all is, but there's nobody doing that overarching check. I'd like to think by, I've, I've taken on, with certainly with the Edinburgh area, I've taken on the thought process when I worked with Ness um, that you have two instructors and therefore you are checking on each other. And you can always say, oh, I, I forgot to say this earlier on or Jimmy men mentioned this briefly, but this is a better way maybe to make you understand it. So you can, you bounce off each other and there is a quality aspect insured in it. So, yes, it varies. But I think we go into schools, we go into poorer areas. We're not asking anybody to contribute anything other than they've already raised money within their community probably to get the defibrillator. And that's what I really like about St John is, yes, there's a lot of this. The defibrillators are in areas where maybe there is some money, but they're on streets where people can access them. The, there's a big push to make them public access, not this is the bowling clubs and it's staying inside the bowling club uh, or the golf club, whoever. Um, but it is there, and I know from conversations I've had, people are very aware of where a defibrillator should be and they're now looking at areas, right, why is there a patch here where there's not a defibrillator and what do we do about that? Thank you. Um, I think that's actually all of my questions. So oh, good. <laughs> Is there anything you would like to add? Is Gosh. there anything that I've missed that you would like to tell me? No, I don't think so. I'm keeping it in the family. I've got both my daughters signed up. <laughs> um one is a teacher and the other one works in a bank at the moment. So they're, they've they both um, signed up. My older daughter is very much a bouncy. This is how you do it. Loves doing it with children. They just respond to her completely. The other one is much quieter and will be much more um, 
intuitive with people who just need a wee bit longer to take uh, to get it right. So they would make a good pair. Yes, they would. <laughs> they would. But. Well, thank you very much, Anne. Much appreciate you spending time with me today. You're welcome. Thank you.